We are a go to discuss neo-feudalistic indentured servitude slash slavery with lots of gray area in the middle. Awesome. All right. So, so we were going to, we were going to discuss, um, anarcho-capitalism and slavery and, uh, um, how basically how free market defense and free market law would work, um, which, which would be the absence of slavery, um, the absence of, uh, forced theft, right? Which is, is what taxation is. And, uh, and then, you know, we, we thought we'd talk about some of the possible, um, dystopian futures that that could create. So, and why I don't, why, why I don't think it's an issue, but it's a, it's a good question. So, um, so go ahead and, and recap what, uh, what the concern is, right? So we're, we're in a place where Bitcoin has made it no longer cost effective to, um, to steal from people. So taxation is out inflate, you know, stealing from people, savings through inflation is out. We're in a world that's basically uh, stateless in that sense. And, uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, there's a, pretty much just my main concern is in some kind of big economic upheaval like that, you're going to have a lot of losers, so to speak. And the way that we're kind of transitioning towards way more advanced skill sets necessary to actually be like a, a marketable person in, in the labor market, you know, there's a lot of people there who, even though it's not like, hey, we're rounding you up and throwing you in the gulag as a government and work, but like, hey, we're going to offer you this option to pretty much um, just have some shitty roof over your head and food in your stomach and nothing much else to just slave away at, you know, what would effectively conditionally be the same kind of situation slave labor would be, except not coerced, I guess. Okay, so... Uh... So there's two ways that I could I could push back on that future reality. I'll I'll pick the darkest one, um, and that is that they wouldn't be able to afford to do it. There's no way that they could um, if if uh, the economy falls apart and we're worried about you know a big corporation or somebody that's wealthy uh, basically just taking on thousands of people and uh, feeding them and clothing them, but in really crappy conditions. The the, the the answer is they probably wouldn't be able to do it. You'd probably just starve on the street if everything falls apart, because without um, without the ability to steal from people on a mass scale, um, either now or or soon into the future, there's no way you could finance such an operation. Eh, I kind of disagree with that. I think if you look at a lot of like food production techniques, like algae tape ways that you could um kind of boost that with uh different vitamin concentrates and all kinds of shit and like if you look at insects that could be a very cost effective way to pretty much just manufacture protein i mean like you can really drive the cost down for a rock or like to the to the rock core. and my main issue is like you do this well hey Let's really go full dystopia. Let's start speculating on where technology is going to go. Like, what What if you just, all right, this is getting kind of crackpotty, but just like bear with me. Uh, like, go for like, it. like, let's say we really see big progress as far as like computer uh, neural interfaces. And it's like, hey, I can just kind of shut you off, consciously speaking, to just go do this repetitive program for however long and it's you're just off for like the period you're doing that and you get your little time we can cost effectively like put protein in your stomach we can cram you into some horrifyingly shitty compact space and it's like it really just comes down to convincing people to do it and getting the the nutrition requirements down to a cheap enough cost so here's the thing with people they're they're not very useful in a lot of situations like the whole matrix idea of humans being used for uh, for batteries, um, it's just not a it's just not a good system, right? It's not a cost effective way to produce electricity. So slavery and uh, putting people in circumstances where they would be unproductive, right? Because they're very uncomfortable, they're very unpleasant, right? You could you could apply the same thing to like cattle, like beef cows, right? You have to provide them enough of a a decent environment for them to grow and thrive um, and it's not something that a human could live through but you have to give them a much better environment i think than you have to give a chicken right so 
you in order to have a human that's productive you have to give it a certain environment and it's actually you know it could be it could be probably pretty awful compared to what we're used to but it couldn't be worse than whatever that limit is right and what kind of tasks are humans good at really they're they're good at like creative tasks right and uh, that's why it's not cost effective now to have people under slave conditions uh, working in factories, right? Like we, we didn't, uh, we don't have that now because it just doesn't make sense. Like people that are in slave circumstances are so demotivated and so unproductive that they're not profitable anymore. And you can imagine like, you know, basically taking a human and making them a different kind of creature, right? Like you can give them a lobotomy or you can give them some kind of chemical compound like you're talking about, you know, that stuff is in theory possible, but I, I would argue that all you're doing is you're no longer dealing with humans. You're dealing with some other, you know, some other monstrosity of a cre creature. And I won't say that it's impossible that technology can get to the point where, where those sort of things could be created, but, but I, I, I guess I would argue that we're not really talking about human slavery. We're would, talking about something nasty that's been that's been created. I would argue that that centralization of of tribes is a hack, right? Like we were tribal and we were all decentralized, and we had our little like nomadic groups of like people and such, right? And then like there was a hack, and everyone's like, oh. Like there's a common thing shared between there and there, and we can institute trade because there's this issue that we have now because we have a lack of X, Y, Z or whatever. And then, okay, like we have the two parties together can come up with a solution for the, you know, trade basically. And then like, it's a hack. And then like, you have this control over a large, you know, quantities of people that never existed before. We're still like figuring that shit out, I think. Yeah. I mean... I think that uh, I think that if you if you imagine a world in which it's hard to steal from people, then you end up imagining a world that lacks slavery, right? Because slavery is predicated on it being cost effective to steal from people, and I think that world is better than it. it you know, it's better than our current world. All thing, other things being equal, right? If we if we remove slavery, that doesn't mean that you can't throw another ideas like well it might be better in that way but if we could genetically engineer brainless humans you know but maybe brainless humans would be happy humans too i don't know so it's kind of a weird it, it starts getting too far too far out there to uh to really apply to the specific question of should we have human slavery today right i mean i think that's kind of like my concern with things is like as you have technology progress all those lines start to kind of blur and even though like a relationship and an existence like that might be voluntary, I mean, <clears throat> you kind of move one whole set of ethical issues and questions off the table and replace it with a whole new set, even though mechanically it's kind of not too dissimilar. Well, I mean, you could you could have all those same issues with slavery and that would even be worse, uh, arguably. Um, I mean, it, it, it would if you had all that and it wasn't voluntary, that would be worse than if you have all that and it is voluntary, right? I'm saying, like, ha being indebted to somebody, right? Like, I guess technically, w what's the less harsh form of slavery, right? I think if there's a, a situation where um, there's an oppressed people, you know, th there is killing going on, there is warfare, there is bloodshed, right? And you come into that area and you say, like, we are here for humanitarian aid. Like if you come and, and you help us, here's the contract, you do this stuff, you learn these things, and then like you can you can go into the population, right? If that is well taken care of and well like like you know, guarded and, and protected, I think that that's probably okay, as long as it's only that type of scenario where you are helping people who are in less fortunate situations, you're bringing them into a controlled situation, where they get indoctrinated in, into society and they're paying their debt to to society not even it's not even a debt it's more that they're learning it's more that they're gaining the merit that they need to contribute so the 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 solution to like basically a bad deal is competition right so if if uh, you were in a bad circumstance you know the economy fell apart and somebody offered you a job and they were going to pay you a dollar a day to uh to clean toilets that would suck but as long as it's voluntary 
um, and we can uh, we don't have um, a lot of a lot of basically crime and corruption, right? That's just destroying the system. We would rebuild the economy pretty quick to the point where somebody would come along and offer you two dollars an hour to sell hot dogs, right, or make hot dogs or something. Um, the, I mean, if if we all become poor because we destroy everything that we have, we're going to be poor, and you know that's not good. But if we don't have slavery, we'll reestablish those uh, those means of production over time, and then uh, you know we would certainly establish them a lot faster than if we were um, if we were engaged in in slavery and force and violence because that's not productive. Yeah, totally. And then there's also the issue of like, in those situations, isn't it best to try to, to like, help, you know, in any way possible that the that nation instead of just inviting them over, you know, like make that nation prosperous, make them, you know, help, help them to, to, to interact with us better. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if, if we're not talking about the future, if we're talking about like right now with Africa, for example, um, yeah, if all we would have to do to make Africa really prosperous is stop starving, right? We 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 treat Africa like I don't know, like England treated Germany uh, pre World War One. Like we just we economically starve it, and then um, and then look at it and go, oh, isn't that sad? Like they're not allowed to sell their their agricultural goods, which are pretty much what they have to start out with, because that's how all civilizations build up um, to anybody in Europe or the United States. But you know, we send them foreign aid. So if we would just allow them to sell stuff that people want to buy, they would do be doing a whole lot better than they are now. Yeah. So the, the other, I guess the other, um, the other way that I would push back on that is I would say like the, the downside version of that is if the economy is completely destroyed and everybody's super poor, nobody's going to be able to afford to treat you like crap and pay you less than you're worth. Um, but on the other side, you know, there's the, the reality that if we don't completely destroy things um, and we allow the economy to work more freely, then we'll, we'll increase wealth really rapidly. And so you, you might start out with a, you know, a toilet cleaning job um, and they're feeding you soil and green, but soon after, um, as wealth, you know, was reestablished as the means of production were built back up, somebody would offer you something better. And if it's a voluntary relationship, then you're fine because you can just pop down and go there. Yep. But see, like, again, like, I think. I really I, think this ignores kind of the the X factor that technology brings to the picture as well as just the, the race to the bottom as far as producing things. I mean, at the end of the day, <clears throat> all people need are specific proteins and nutrients that you can, if you really just boil it down, can get pretty cheap with producing. And it's like, well, you can take it or leave it. Right. But the, I mean, in a free environment, there's, there's a desire. Everybody has, I mean, again, assuming that we're still talking about humans, all humans have a desire to have better circumstances than they have right now. And uh, so that means that they're going to work towards those circumstances. And in, unless they're hindered in some way from making progress, um, you know, the, the earth that we inhabit is pretty abundant, um, relatively speaking, for the stuff that we want to accomplish. So there's no reason to think that um, even if we were to start over, you know, Stone Age tomorrow, there's no reason to think in 2,000 years that we would actually be poorer than we are right now. Technology is just a tool, right? So we're going to use those tools more and more effectively to accomplish whatever it is that we want to accomplish. Well, yeah, but by the same token, those tools kind of change us in how they affect our interactions with the environment. I mean, like, if you just look at how the internet is starting to change things, like behavior uh, changes, when you start looking from the baby boomers to the millennial generations, when you start looking at how predominantly available technology is, just the uh, things like the, the kinds of neurological studies that look at how we actually process and store information in our brain now, where, like, people's brains are starting to skip that, like actually storing the information it's like oh no here's just how i get to it with the aid of something like google and it's like that that 
technology has a way of just fundamentally altering our nature as it becomes something ubiquitous in society. Yeah, I know, but I mean, that's been happening for a long time. I'm sure that a 20 year old, a thousand years ago, the, the part of their brain that's responsible for throwing was probably way more developed, right? And now we've lost that, but who cares? I don't, I don't need to throw stuff very often, so that's okay. And if, if we're at a place now where I don't need to memorize things as much because I have access to other stuff and that part of my brain is less active, I'm okay with that too, right? And if, you know, if something happens and the tools go away, I'm pretty sure that unless I'm old, my brain is going to adapt just fine and uh, adapt to the new environment. And I'm not saying that nothing bad can happen in the future. I'm just saying that I don't think there's any reason to be pessimistic about it. I mean, the trend on all fronts is positive. Um, we're all wealthier than we were 50 years ago. Uh, poverty is way, way down over the last, like, even 20 years. Um, and the I think the things to be pessimistic about would be the empowerment of criminals, right? Like um, corrupt governments to be able to surveil all of their citizens all the time and then um, and then fleece them. But uh, but I would argue that while that's true, I think that the the other side of the coin is even more significant, right? Like uh, average person having access to drones, firearms, um, uh, knowledge of chemistry. Uh, the internet, um, you know, spontaneous communities, uh, and Bitcoin, like, my, my, I think, I, I think, uh, you know, tools tend to get democratized, right? They tend to get cheaper and more available for everybody. And I don't think anybody would really, I mean, outside of the, uh, some, some really sort of bad anomalies, I think, I don't think anybody would argue that the individual isn't being more and more empowered you know, year by year. I remember like 20 years ago, who is that guy? Oh uh, gosh, the New York Times guy that was talking about the empowerment of the individual. And he was just freaked out about the idea of RPGs, right? Like one of, he was a New York Times columnist. Um, uh, anyway, but his, his big example was RPGs versus Blackhawks, right? Oh my God, what are we gonna do? You know, uh, some, some random guy can spend 300 bucks and pick up an RPG that can take out a helicopter. How are we gonna keep control of the situation when the individuals just keep getting more and more powerful? And the answer is you're not, but that's okay because you know most individuals don't wanna hurt anybody. They just wanna live a normal life and we can still have a functioning legal system without the ability to you know catalog and treat humans like cattle. Yeah, but I mean, this is, I don't know. I feel like it's, it's more nuanced than that. I mean, like part of, like part of my whole, I guess, qualm with the anarcho-capitalist way of thinking applied absolutely is like the pretty much denial of the commons that there is some good deal now we're getting into it All but right. but like just just to articulate real quick because i mean like philosophically that is an axiom in my mind like that drives into like my entire views on on the concept no, of free will and why i think of it the way that i do but like that kind of so the commons is huge and that is the main you're like it's good that we're talking about it because the idea of like the tragedy of the commons or the free rider problem or whatever is the main thing that people use to say no you, you can't have a society full of free individuals we have to have slave owners because of the tragedy of the commons because of the free rider problem so that's i'm, I'm glad you went there and we should totally take that apart so give me an example of a uh, of a tragedy of the commons and why you don't think anarcho-capitalism addresses it well i mean bitcoin like the reason we have a block size limit is because without that you would not have any kind of predictability in the costs of validating anything you couldn't really have an anarchic like game theoretical dynamic actually find any kind of point of stability or equilibrium but so I mean, to, a like, bad example really quick it's, though it's, like, uh... really quick i, I kind of want to drive to the heart of like my my thoughts on this process it, it kind of ties into like the notion of free will and what, when people argue to like rights or natural rights they always draw the line at 
as long as it's not affecting other people. And I mean, just in an absolutist sense, I like think that is a paradox because in, in a thermodynamic like sense of like a physical model of the universe, there is no line. What you do will have consequences that ripple out infinitely and affect people infinitely. People just have a tendency to draw some kind of arbitrary, vague time horizon after which they consider, okay, that's the line. Like, so I don't have to think past that anymore. Okay, so the, the, the anarcho-capitalist position is not that you can do anything you want as long as it doesn't affect anybody else. Because you're right, that would be absurd. There's everything that I do is going to impact molecules like every there's some crazy uh crazy science uh <laughs> fact like the last breath that jesus breathed you breathe in more than one of those molecules every time you inhale so we're just way too connected across space and time for my actions not to have any impact on the world that you live in so that would be an absurd line to draw they do agree that sometimes people say that and they haven't really thought it through. But the, the actual anarcho-capitalist position is as long as I don't impact your private property or your person, right? Like your body belongs to you, your stuff belongs to you. As long as I don't damage your stuff, then I can do whatever I want. That's, that's the, and it, it, that is not even a, um, just to be clear, not like a, a moral definition of virtue, right? Like I could do a lot of things that aren't virtuous um, without impacting your private property. But for all of us to live together and for none of us to be slaves, we have to have that as the line. That as long as I don't impact your private property, you don't have a right to impact my private property. Let's see then to dig further. Like, what do you mean by impact? <clears throat> because you could like, I could do something on my property that damages the value of your property, but all I'm, I can sit there and argue all I'm doing is, you know, using my own properties I see fit, even though it still has an effect on you. Yeah, no, that's true. And that's why um, even in anarcho-capitalism, you have to have a legal system. Um, the difference in, in an anarcho-capitalist, or I'll just say, um, Let's say, so I don't have to keep. I'll just say, in, in a free society, um, we would still have a system of property rights, and that requires a legal system to enforce those property rights and even discover what those property rights are, um, because it's not it's not always obvious. And that's why, for example, if you painted your house pink and I hated looking at a pink house, you know, we the we we can assume what the legal system would sort of uncover about the law. And the way that it would do that is it would try to figure out sort of whatever um, whatever expectations were common in that community, um, what were what were sort of the social norms that had developed over time, all those sort of things, right? And it, it wouldn't necessarily be obvious. And it would it, a law like good law is a product, just like a good toothbrush is a product. And so we would need competition amongst judges and the ability to opt in and opt out and support different judges so that over time we would encourage the discovery of um, the most just laws. Um, but, uh, but on the other hand, if, um, and so like the pink house thing, depending, you know, if, if, we're, uh, if we're right next to each other and there's like three feet between us and uh, I'll just give you an example of how a just judge might try to educate this. Um, if our houses are very close together and for the last 40 years, everybody in the neighborhood has lived together and they've painted their houses in pastels and that's been expected and standard and nobody's ever really tried to paint their house hot pink before. Um, and uh, all the neighbors are pretty upset about it too. And they all feel a sense of betrayal right over this. And, um, and you can show that your property value actually went down as a result of this. If I was that judge, I would probably say, no, you can't do this, right? You've actually, you've, you've broken the rules that were established over time in the community. You've screwed over your neighbor. He's poor an hour as a result, and you got to make restitution, right? Um, and if you don't like that example, maybe, you know, maybe instead of painting his house pink, maybe he um, uh, covers his house in dog shit, right? Because he's pissed off at his neighbor and he moves out and he just goes by periodically and covers his house in dog shit. Like there, there, there has to be some, some sense applied to try to figure out when, uh, when you have actually damaged somebody else's property or not. And it could be noise ordinances. Like it's not, it's not super simplistic, 
but there, you know, humans have discovered these things over time in the past. We had English common law that was pretty effective um, at figuring these things out. And uh, really, it's hard for us to imagine how that would work because we're just, we've been raised as slaves where, you know, the slave owners just tell us arbitrarily, or maybe there's a voting ceremony, but at the end of the day, it's like, you know, it's dictated from, um, from some official far, far away that we have no impact or no relationship with and have no knowledge of really and um it's just much more pushed down on us than sort of organically developed out of the community um but but it has worked in the past right we're not talking about a legal system that is completely uh hypothetical okay and like if first to say like i it's not that i in any way kind of disagree with a, like a functioning process that works like that but to kind of bring it back to like the the ideological point like that's still a a gray area that's sort of arbitrary that i would call the commons where it is not entirely just a function of of a market there at some point some buddy or buddies has to actually arbitrate that they have to arbitrarily decide like which way things will be handled and i don't ever see like the possibility of there being an ideological consistent like measure used in that situation it's arbitrary, it's arbitrary. because it's, it's it's some some person has to arbitrarily arbitrate it like make a decision where there is no clear like boundary established on where that line of rights starts and ends and that's kind of the issue I have with thinking about systems like this playing out like purely in practice is eventually like you're going to have the same kind of, of tribal dynamics where like you just have the, the arbitrator that people flock to and, and power structures developing out of that. And if you don't have some kind of overall like non-localized attempt to kind of deal with the concept of the commons <clears throat> you're just going to have people grab up territories and lock down those territories and then eventually it's still an abstract kind of the same problems we have now you're just stuck somewhere you have to accept how shit's done there and you don't really have a, a choice necessarily it, like with constraints of resources you have available, like other options you've had or made available by how like that commons has been cut up. And it's still abstractly kind of the same scenario where you can still have people kind of situationally coerced into accepting something just because of how that notion of, of universally addressing the commons was just kind of shrugged off. Well, it's, it, it wouldn't be a, a commons issue, right? Because we're talking about a, the example that we had there was a situation where you have um, you have two houses that are right next to each other. There's like three well, yeah, yeah, apart I mean, or whatever. Well, yeah, yeah. So, like so it's the commons a, is in like that that point of dispute about like where your ability to end or like do things should end. Yeah. You know how do I mean? how do we define property rights? Like who has rights to what? Um, yeah. That that I mean, I think that. Uh, we're not going to end up in a place where there's never going to be any human conflict and there's never going to be any disputes about what belongs to who. I think the best that we can do is say, what is a system that, um, that would result in the, the, most, um, the most people incentivized the most for justice, right? Or for, um, uh, I think we lost, no, we didn't lose you. Um, and, and so that's all we're going for, right? It's not quite as, it's not utopian, right? It's not super ambitious. It's just saying, let's create a system. And I think that we would be surprised about how great it would be by comparison, but we're all we're really trying to do is say, let's have a system where there isn't slavery and where people are uh, paid to do justice, right? And if you think about something like the iPhone, uh, I think it's pretty incredible what we have in these sort of devices, right? You think about the internet, you think about Bitcoin, you think about all of like the, the human created um, products or services that we really enjoy. I think they're way better than anything that somebody 10 years before they were invented could have really clearly imagined. And I think it would be the same way with, with a legal system that is based on 
trying to discover private property and has a competitiveness to it, right? So if I was a bad judge, people would stop subscribing to my service for being a judge. Um, and so I'm really incentivized to one, find the truth of the situation and make a good judgment. And two, um, correct any mistakes that I've made. And three, look at the judgments that other people have made. Because if you know one town over the circumstances were almost exactly the same and some judge spent six months interviewing people and deliberating and trying to find the truth of the situation, then that precedent could save me a lot of time and energy and, and cost and also make it more likely that people will go along with what I say, right? When I say, hey, it's not okay to paint your house pink, I don't want to lose any subscribers. So being able to say, you know, this is something that I'm citing and it's got, you know, a really well-written uh, argument behind it and then I can reference that, that's, that's all in my interest. So we're just trying to create a circumstance in which I'm incentivized to be the most just judge possible. And if I make a mistake, just like in the market as an entrepreneur, if I make a mistake, I'm, I'm penalized for that. Um, and if I do good, I'm rewarded for that. Yeah, but see, that, that's kind of like the root of my issue, though, is when you talk about like judges based on subscription, well, let's say um, I'm involved in a dispute with you and my response to any judge that you're a part of is go fuck yourself. Um, I refuse to subject myself to that judgment. Yeah, that's easy. Um, I mean, it doesn't sound easy if you haven't, if you haven't studied this stuff, but the 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 um and i don't mean to say it's easy like in a flippant way because this stuff all sounded absolutely psychotic to yeah. me about five yeah. years ago um but it, it's uh these problems have been worked on like in extreme detail for 50 plus years so the the way that this would work probably right and again the challenge is we're trying to think of what a free market would look like in uh, legal and private defense um, when it would be really hard for us to imagine what a free market would look like in electronics before we saw it happen, right? Because these systems, they, they get created spontaneously over time and they evolve and they get better and better. Um, so we're, we're really trying to guess a lot, but here is one way that is very plausible, right? That's not necessarily how it would work out. It probably would work out much better, but um, I would uh, I would have an insurance policy. Let, let's say that you're my neighbor and you're the one that that is covering your uh, I don't know. Let's uh, let's just say that you're you're uh, you're really dirty. Like you don't take out your garbage. You're a hoarder and you put all your trash in your front yard, right? And I live right next to you and the stench and the eyesore and everything is hindering my property value. And I have a subscription service um, to uh, defense company A, right? And I go to defense company A and I say, hey, look, I have a problem here. My neighbor is, um, my neighbor is harming my property value. That's what I pay you guys for, right? I pay you X number of dollars per month to keep my, my person and my property secure. You're not doing your job. So what I would expect is defense company A would come by and they would look at the situation. Hopefully, if, if they're a good company, they would have noticed it and dealt with it before I even said anything, right? Because again, that's what I'm paying them for. And they would they would probably, they would be incentivized to solve this problem in the most cost-effective way with the least amount of legal liability, right? So we're not talking about somebody wanting to show up with, you know, 25 guys with shotguns kicking in your front door to have a conversation about the trash in your front yard, because that's just a waste of money right and that's not how markets work um, so what would probably happen is somebody would come knock on your door and try to get you to clean up your trash right and, and stop hindering my property rights if you didn't go along with that defense company a would call legal company a right or law service a and say hey we have a we have a situation here we need to take this guy to court we need a judgment right and it would make sense to try to have those services separated because you, um, as defense company A, you have something that you specialize in, right? Like in a free market, people tend to solve the smallest, narrowest problem that they can. I know we don't think of that because of these huge corporations, but they're all government subsidized and government backed, right? Through all kinds of things. So 
So this specialized company that's doing defense is going to have a relationship with a legal service that's doing legal work. Um, and so there would be a there would be a court case. And let's say that I won the court case, um, and the judgment was you have to clean up your front yard. You'd be informed of that judgment if you if you were smart, you would have shown up for court, right? Or you would have engaged and had a conversation with legal company A. But let's just say that you're an ass um, because you know you've already got trash in your front yard anyway, and you ignored the defense company that came by and said, "Hey, you're screwing this guy over, and that's not okay." So maybe you're an ass and you don't show up to court. You'd have a judgment against you saying, "Hey, you have to you have to make this right," right? And that would give defense company A that I'm contracted with the ability to enforce that judgment without as much concern for for backlash right and and uh and liability and um and you know private companies tend to escalate very slowly so it would probably be like hey i just want you to know there's a legal judgment against you it gives us the right to um to extract you know payment from you right um just like with a uh um with a private collection service. But if you were stubborn enough, it would probably get to the point where your property was being seized and auctioned off and all of the um, all the damage that you caused would be paid out of that and then you would be given whatever was left over. Yeah, but like that's kind of my issue with that is like at no point is that me voluntarily subjecting myself to anything. And like I mean, well, really, no, no, in that no. situation, I would you, you don't I would to... shoot at the fucking security the second they came onto my property. If somebody tried okay, to take so my house, I would let's, blow let's it up. Let's walk through these scenarios. Let's let's walk through these scenarios and see how this would work out for you in a in a sort of free market situation. So, so uh, we'll, we'll assume first that you're not paying for any security services of your own, um, and that you're just a crazy person. Then we can talk about how it would probably play out if you had a subscription to a competing security service. Um, and again, this stuff sounds wacky, but man, if you look at the complexity of any of the things that we take for granted, they're they're easily this complicated, and nobody would expect them to work um, as smoothly as they do. So. Again, I'm trying to like theorize and say how I think it would plausibly work, but it would probably be a hell of a lot smoother because because all of these decisions that I'm having to make on the fly would be made by tens of thousands of people over a period of time, and the people that made the smarter decisions would be rewarded and given more opportunity to make more such decisions. Right? There's specialization. There's all these things. So I feel like that's the more important message here is that um, I, I'm happy to to try to help you kind of see how it might work but the reality is is that the market solves all kinds of problems that are more important to you than private security and more important to me than private security like the free market solves the fact that i can drink water the free market solves the fact that i have food in my belly right like these things are even more essential than not getting punched in the face or having your property taken and if free individual people cooperating together without um, without the need to own slaves um, or force anybody to participate in something they don't want to participate in can solve all of those problems. Our default position, if we weren't indoctrinated from birth, would be the free market can probably solve these problems too, right? I get it. Our default position fr from indoctrination is we we believe that only a slave master can solve these problems. But if we take a step back and try to try to come at it from that perspective, I think it'll be easier. So if the private security company shows up to say, hey, man, you got to pick up your trash, are you saying you're going to shoot at them at that point? They threaten at me. What point, yeah. At what point are you going to, okay, all right. So, you know, now you've got some guy that his job is basically just to, to show up and be friendly, right? Because in a, in a free market, if you want to try to get somebody to pick up trash, you probably don't have the guy with an M16 on his back have the first conversation. It wouldn't be very cost effective. It would tend to have people that are unstable do what you're talking about doing more than, you know, just a friendly, nice guy. I mean, there's a reason that bill collectors are typically, you know, not super aggressive uh, when they knock on your front door. So, so, you know, you essentially have a bill collector knocking on your front door type and you start shooting through the window. Well, that, that's okay because <laughs> there's there's ways to deal with you, and now you're no longer my problem, right? Like the least of the issues in play here is the trash in the front yard. So now you've attempted to murder a completely innocent person that didn't try to hurt you in any way and just wanted to tell you 
Uh, I just wanted to have a conversation with you. Right? Well, no, but my point, if, if they're threatening me with force for not doing what they say with my own property, then I'm no, responding to a threat. At first, they wouldn't threaten you with force. At first, well, I they would, would wait tell until you they that, did. Okay, so, so the first point at which force is really coming into play would probably be after there was a legal judgment against you, right? So, so a legal service has said, you are hindering the property of my client, and now I have to deal with this, right? But I have, I have a lot more um, justification and sort of legitimacy as I go about it. So the next person that would come back to you, um, and I'll, I'll just, yeah, the next person that would come back to you would say, look, here's the legal judgment that says, you are hindering the property rights of Bob. Now, nobody's trying to threaten you or hurt you at this point or do anything like that, but, but you understand, because you're, you're not stupid, that, uh, that, the, that if somebody says you're hurting my property rights, right, you're damaging my property rights, that it's expected to be taken care of, right? And so at that point, if you didn't clean up your trash, at a certain point, people would come to your house um, in order to put you in custody so they could sell your property. My guess is there would probably be another legal, a court case or two, right? Because as a private security owner, before I kick in your front door, I want to have as much backing as possible, right? I, I want to be as little liable as possible. So this would probably be a year process, right? Where you're, you're receiving ever in, because I want to minimize the chance that one, I could kill you um, because that's that's not good for business, right? Uh, people aren't going to want to hire me as much if I go around killing people. I'm going to want to minimize the possibility that I shoot through a wall and kill, God forbid, one of my customers, right? Or any innocent bystander, because I'm not the government, right? As as a private security force, um, I'm like a I'm a I'm a rent a cop, right? And if rent a cops kill people, rent a cops go to jail. They're not the police, right? So. So I'm going to go through a pretty long process if I if I own this private defense company. And you got to keep in mind that I'm I'm not doing this one off, right? This is a business, so I've got processes and procedures, and I'm trying to be as efficient and effective as possible because otherwise somebody will replace me. So at a certain point, yeah, there's going to be uh, either a conversation where you understand what's going to happen next. But typically, I think. What, what I would do if I was running a private security company is I would try to just have normal conversations with you and assess whether you were mentally stable or not. And if I thought that you were the kind of person that's going to shoot somebody as soon as they say, look, if you don't clean this shit up, somebody's going to take your property, um, then I wouldn't say that to you, right? And I'm going to have people that specialize in these sorts of conversations, right? Um, and so let's, let's say that we get to the point where we're like, you know what, this guy is he's out of his mind and he's not going to clean up the yard he's going to continue to destroy my client's property value then that's that's basically a swat situation right like we're going to either go in and put you in prison but basically we're going to we're going to use violence against a criminal at this point right you you've escalated it to that point um it's going to be done really you know like a free market does anything it's going to be done efficiently and effectively and my guess is it's probably going to be uh, when you're driving to the grocery store, when you're alone, it's probably not going to be when you're in the house with an unknown number of innocent people around, right? Because that's not that's not good for my bottom line. Um, so at a certain point, yeah, you're probably going to get rammed by a car, or somebody's going to shoot out your tire, and you're you're basically going to get carjacked, right? And if you think that um, that a private security force that does this for a living, um, that's well funded, uh, like if you want to go up against a free market in that situation, you can, but but uh, you know, it's not likely that that's gonna that's gonna end well for you. So you might do that, but you probably wouldn't because you'd have heard of other people screwing around with Defense Company A, and it didn't end well. And you probably would actually pay Defense Company A if they were good. You'd probably be a subscriber, um, but you're certainly not going to uh, you're certainly not going to get tough with them as just some dude that wants to leave trash in his front yard. Well, I mean, like, let's just kind of go back to, like, my main qualm with this. It's not necessarily in its, its effectiveness in the real world. It's <clears throat> there is no ideological difference between this and the government claiming they have a right to kick your door in and take your shit. It's effectively There's a huge difference. Well, not really in, in, in the, the ideology or the philosophy of it. Because, like I said, we, we have still yet to establish a like completely defined commons 
they when this no, is we acceptable, did. when this is not. We've, we've, we've described an exploratory no, we... process through which people can try to arbitrarily ascertain in a case-by-case -case basis, are we going to do this or not? But we haven't established a completely universal definition of like when this is okay, when this isn't okay. At the end of the day, it's still arbitrary decisions made by people looking at a situation saying we have the right to do what we decide to do. Right. The universe doesn't become any simpler just because we come up with a system that is as good as we can as we can imagine. And you make you have to make judgments all the time, right? Um, if if you are in a situation and you see somebody in a parking lot in a mall getting beat up, you can call that an arbitrary decision. But you're going to have to make a decision about whether it's right or wrong for you to stop that. Uh, situation and how far you should take it, right? You have to decide, you can say arbitrarily, do I punch the person or do I pull out a gun or, you know, what do I do in this situation? So there's no, there's no utopian solution where we can, you know, go, all right, this is universally right and wrong in all circumstances. Um, the universe is really complex and the best that we can do is create systems that encourage, um, that incentivize the best possible outcomes. Well, yeah, and it's like this is this is kind of where I think I really get into shit with a lot of anarcho-capitalists is because I I think that a lot of what they argue is the proper way to structure society is the correct way to do so, but I arrive at that conclusion pretty much through just a uh, like practicality. Like I think practically that's the most efficient way proposed to do something and i just kind of take issue with people who try to argue like these kinds of systems or like market processes for providing things society needs necessary from a, an ideological point of view because from my like set of axioms and where i approach this ideologically it's not really any different than what we have now it's just well, more efficient is, no, no, the difference, it's very much ideological because the difference is that what we have right now is innocent people have their stuff taken from them, right? And that is by design, that's part of no, the system. No, but yeah, you, like, you, you don't think that there's the potential for, there's the potential say, like for some abuse, community but, that but there's is, a difference no, between like, I mean, an accident like JW, and let's, a by let's design. Imagine, let's imagine there's a small community somewhere that's a small group of families. They're, they're very like closely connected. Okay. They've, they've been that but way me, for generations. And now point, some person you... interjects himself into that situation and As they just they don't, don't like him. They don't like what he's doing, even though it's not really causing any harm. And so they kind of go through a process with complaints like this or like there, there's still ways this can there's... go wrong. That's true. I mean, this is not heaven, right? And I don't want to, I don't want to make it seem like Murray Rothbard was Jesus Christ. He wasn't, he was just a smart guy that worked on some problems and came up with some tools and ideas that um, that historically have been found to be effective and theoretically are sound and they they don't um, they don't require the use of um, force or violence they don't require it right they don't require the use of force and violence against innocence and that's a big difference right it's not that this system couldn't be abused and it couldn't fall apart in certain circumstances it's not that crime couldn't still happen or even that a judge might not get paid off and make a bad decision because he was paid off right it doesn't preclude all of that entirely but it doesn't require it right you can have you can at least attempt to have a system that doesn't involve killing innocent people and taking their stuff and um and further it incentivizes uh justice so we'll talk about the scenario that you're thinking of where something goes wrong and i'm not going to be able to say that it couldn't happen or that they couldn't possibly get away with it right um but what i can say is that the the system overall um of just and it's really just uh just thinking through how free people would naturally interact with each other right um incentivizes um because of human nature uh, justice and um, and it's only because we've lived in an environment where that's not incentivized at all the opposite of is incentivized or we're not even sure that that's valuable but but it's really valuable so and that that is a very ideological moral and ethical position that I take and that is I cannot advocate human slavery I cannot advocate 
hurting innocent people. Um, I can advocate a system of, of justice, even though it's not heaven. No, but that's kind of my point is like, I, I, I don't agree with arguing for these things from the point of ideology. And like, I, I argue for many of the same things from a, a stance of practicality, but it's just ideologically speaking, if you can't make that that basis upon which the, the boundary of rights is decided non-arbitrary, well then, ideologically speaking, I can't honestly say that's different. I can say it's more it effective, different. I can say it's more efficient, but I can't, like from my view of the world, say that that is ideologically different. I can just say it works better, it's more cost effective, it would likely have a lot less instances of the kinds of things that we look at now in a world ran by governments. Okay, but so I that, can't boil that, it that, down to like this is ideologically pure where what we have now isn't. So let me ask you this. If, if there's a small town and there's a judge and, um, and we all, you know, there's 12 of us and we say, okay, this person's full-time job is going to be um, to study the law and they're going to make judgments and help us discover where the lions of property exist, and um, and we're going to we're going to opt in. We're going to you know all of us are in agreement. Uh, there's no force or violence here. There's only twelve families, and we just decide. Yep, we'll pay this guy a thousand dollars a month each to to do this job for us. Um, and he he does that. Is there anything unethical about that? Right. Is there well, anything no, that... but at that point, I would say okay, well, we're discussing a government. It's just a government no, no, no. that's voluntary. It's a government that's in. voluntary is not a government that, uh, or it's not, it, the, the difference between a government and a, uh, a market service is voluntary or is whether it is voluntary or not. So in that circumstance, we, the 12 families, agreed voluntarily to give the guy $1,000 a month to provide this service for us. And we both agree that that's ethical. There's no problem with that. Now, the way that it could work, right, the way that a government system uh, that more parallels our current government system would work is the judge says, listen, you're going to give me $1,000 a month. And if you don't give me $1,000 a month, I'm going to take your stuff. It's not voluntary. You have no choice. Okay, well, here's here's let, let me let me take this. And that, that's and ideological, though. That's All right, really but, but JW, let me let me put it this way. Um, let's say you have that scenario, okay, and we'll look at two different ways mm -hmm. that um, somebody else can be in that community, so to say. Like, let's say, hey, I walk up, I knock on your door, you have a big or a big plot of land. Uh, let me buy a few acres from you and build a house on it. They sign up a, a deed of sale. That that person signs into this fucking legal arrangement they have. They've opted into it. But now let's look at a different situation. <clears throat> let's say there were thirteen families, and only twelve of them did this. And me on the edge, like of of all of their collective property that have entered into this legal agreement, don't. And then let's replay that situation with the pink house. Well. I have not opted in to any kind of arbitration agreement that you. No, it doesn't matter have. whether you've opted into it or not. So let's let's do one analogy at a time, okay? So let's say that there's 13 people, 12 of them, or 14 people, 12 of them decide that they're going to pay a judge a thousand dollars a month to study the law and help them arbitrate disputes, and one of them says, "I'm not opting in." That's still there's still no problem there, right? We both agree that ideologically and morally, this circumstance is still sound. At least up to this point. Sorry, can you repeat that? I just had a bunch of alarms go off. No, it's okay. I was saying that let's imagine there's 14 people. 12 of them decide they're going to pay a thousand bucks a month to the judge. The 14th person says, I don't want any part of it. Right. And, um, and doesn't. Right. So he hasn't paid the judge. There's up to that point, there isn't a, there's no, there's no question of morality. Right. Like there's voluntary uh, participation of, 12 people to buy somebody's service and the 13th person decided not to. So that's it's a very ethical and uh, reasonable circumstance to be in, right? Yeah. Okay, so the obvious question is what's gonna happen when that person that opted out of the legal system commits a crime? And the answer is that 
the, um, the, the same thing that would happen, uh, it, the same thing that you would hope would happen, right? What you're hoping is that if that person commits a crime, one, uh, we're going to discover whether that crime was committed or not um, as effectively as we're capable of, right? Now, if we're out on the frontier, we're not going to have CSI Miami involved, but, um, but you wouldn't expect that, right? What you're expecting from a standpoint of morality is for a reasonably high standard of care to be applied to discovering the truth, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, like, I, I, I kind of want to keep things specifically to like uh, something that's arguable about whether it's a crime or not, like the the, the pink house example. Like, let's okay, say so, I so is the he, person he outside paints, of that. Like, the fourteenth yeah. guy paints his house pink, and um, and the judge looks at the circumstances and discovers believes that 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 guy has actually committed a crime. Well. I mean, the pink house thing kind of sucks when we're trying to think of the frontier or something. But let's say, uh, let's say he's leaving garbage in his front yard, right? Like he's he's not taking out his refuse. Uh, sewage and garbage is all around his front yard, um, and the judge says, "Yep, that is definitely an infringement on the private property of Bob." Right? Um, I still don't see any moral issue there, right? Um, again, no, no, you can't point to any individual in the circumstance and say that person uh, is doing the wrong thing, except for the 14th person that's leaving shit in his yard, right? Because that's actually, it is um, to the best of the people's ability that are involved in this situation, harming his neighbor, right? Damaging his neighbor's property and ability to provide for his children and live. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, you know, I, I hate to be a dick, but, you know, let's, let's like, stick with the pink house example. It's not something that's, like, an obvious health hazard or actually doing anything other than, like, they don't want him doing that. Right, but this, again, goes back to, like, you, it, the, the context is really important, right? If you're, if you're talking about the frontier and somebody paints their house pink, it definitely is a stretch of the imagination to come to the conclusion that that there's property rights being violated. And I would say that a reasonable human being trying to find the truth in that situation is going to say, "No, who cares whether the house is pink?" But if yeah, we're talking like, like, if like, we're like, talking about a uh, like a real tight knit community of houses that are right next to each other that are you know really glorified rooms in a bigger house, right? Because they're a foot and a half apart or something like that, then uh, then that's different. But that goes to the point that you can't, you can't, um, the universe is too complicated. People are too complicated. No, but right? the, the, the that's, arrangements that's and kind of the heart that of my point in, is at some point you can't avoid effectively coercively subjecting problem. somebody to something they don't opt into. And I mean, yes, again, I'm not arguing that's against correct. the mechanics, but, but, but like no, that's but the, the, the difference is whether you're whether you are an acting force against somebody that is a criminal that has found to be been found to be a criminal or not now it doesn't mean that the system couldn't make a mistake but you got to give me that that is a very important distinction right right now we enact force and violence and take people's stuff that we all agree are innocent and if we only did that in circumstances where um we had a reasonably set up system to determine that somebody's a criminal and then we only used violence against somebody if that was found to be true that's far superior from superior from an ethical standpoint from a very ideological you know ethical uh position but see like that's kind of where like i can't really buy into the argument from ideology because that's entirely down to who is labeling this person a criminal or a criminal and the basis upon which they arrived at I that and it's still it's... like at some level somebody is granting themselves an authority regardless of where the source came from to engage in violence they are they saying are... So let me, let me ask justified you this. in this let me ask you this is it ethical if i take a machete and, and kill somebody that's innocent obviously not right but what if i'm a surgeon and i find somebody along the road that's hurt and I get out my scalpel and I start cutting them up and trying to sew them back up again. And I still kill them. That's the difference between a system of justice that's designed and intended to find justice, right? That's oriented towards that, that may err, and a system that is specifically designed to damage the innocent. And if you can't get your head around the idea that there's a huge gap from a moral 
an ethical standpoint between those two systems, even though they both might error, right? But one is actually designed to error and intends to error and is uh, can only function with error. And the other is um, designed to do good, but could, but isn't all, you know, it isn't infallible. There's a world of difference between those two things, man. Well, see, but that's the thing, like to kind of wind back to like my initial comments on like the, the whole indentured servitude aspect of things. It's like once you start having groups of people glommed together and when you look at the difference between something like a small town and say a major metropolitan city, like you are going to have the, the kinds of power structures that aren't as accurate just the bigger you scale up. And in those kinds of scenarios, you're going to see private entities like clamp down all resources, everything that could constitute a commons. And then like in effect, you are still in a flawed, manipulatable system that is in, in an indirect way coercive. That, that's so going why, to take why is the, it that you have food right now? Why is, how is it possible that you have food from the free market and it's actually higher quality, better food than anybody's had access to throughout all of human history? Um, how is that possible when you're so confident that a free market on security services would result in your oppression? Well, I mean, think about the dynamics in, in a city like how like dense the population is how large an amount of people you have in small areas and just that whole dynamic of like well hey now these little subsets of people can just pay money to oh here's a problem go deal with that oh here's a problem uh come to this conclusion on it and i mean that's my problem is like this, this kind of model would work perfectly in a fucking small town don't, don't but and I still we think were, it would be more efficient. Hold, it, hold, 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 I still think it would be more efficient in in a place like a city. But th as you scale up from that small town, you're still going to see the same kind of abstract issues and problems. I think. And don't, it's you, the, don't you think that somebody a hundred years ago might have said that about food production? Right. Well, look, a free market is going to function fine when eighty percent of the population is a farmer and everybody is in rural circumstances. But if you get people consolidated into a city, you know, then you need some planning involved, right? Then you need to have food transported from the country to the city. You're gonna to have to come up with some way to disperse it. How are you gonna decide who gets what? And certainly the rich are gonna screw over the poor because they're going to pay off the truck drivers to make sure that only they get the best food and that everybody else starves. But somehow all of that works just fine. And again, food production is more fundamental to life than even security services. So why why do you think it's so different? Why do you think one can be provided by free individuals cooperating together and competing for the opportunity to provide those services to each other in food production? But when it comes to providing legal services, uh, there has to be some immorality uh, built in. Well, I mean, like, put put my, like, t take my argument in, like, the pink house situation about the, the coercion and the ideology aside and look at the practicality of it. That is a much more practical way to handle those kinds of situations. But how do you scale up those kind of gray area disputes in something like a major city? So we, where's, we know where's exactly the precedent? How that where's works. the norm? Where do we those know exactly boundaries how that works? lie? Because we have, we have had English common law, like... The, the, the ironic thing about some of this stuff is that most of what people uh, object to about a private legal system um, is actually the way a lot of humanity, right? Like a lot of us have lived, if you look at the last, you know, three, 4,000 years, right? There, there hasn't always been a state that has complete control over a geographic region uh, with an iron fist of, uh, of control. Like this is a, this is a very relatively new phenomenon throughout history. So if, we, if you're asking how would a small town uh, be able to function with a legal system, we can we can theorize, right? Again, no, no, more, more the, like the free the, market the is going to provide a better solution. Um, it has a lot. Of, it has access to technology that wasn't available in the 14, 1500s, right? So I'm sure the answer is better than what I can tell you. But 
one of the ways that that can function is you can have traveling judges, right, that go on circuits and hear court cases on a regular basis. Um, and if there was a judgment that turned out, so let's say that a small town has a, you know, has one judge, um, not the sharpest knife in the drawer because he's the country bumpkin that got shipped out to the frontier or whatever, and he makes some bad decisions. Well, there, there. It's not like we don't have an, a, a long, rich history of an appeals process, right? Where somebody could appeal up several levels before their uh, their ultimate judgment got enacted, right? So, in that case with the pink house, you can you can bet that it probably would have been escalated, um, like I said before, two or three levels above the initial judge because everybody's going to want cover, right? Because everybody has legal liability in this situation. Before somebody you know shoots out your tire on the highway and you know gets guns and violence involved over uh, garbage and trash in your front yard, they're going to want to make sure that they have uh, all all their bases covered because it's in their own selfish interest to do so. Um, and so, yeah, it would there would be uh, there would be an appeals process and there would be multiple judgments before um, before well, somebody is going to well, you, know, you know. What if? What if you can't afford the appeals process? What if you can't afford the time required to participate in the appeals process, right? That's what, that's what I what ran if, into today. I, what, I ran into today being threatened to be picked up by another township for a warrant, which is which I've already called and talked to them about. So it was completely an erroneous uh, threat, right? And they basically tried to talk me out of the appeal which at that point, I know no matter what I try, I, I'm not going to get my way. So I decided to just pay it off. And, uh, you know, imagine I didn't have the money to do it and I got to go on a payment plan and or set up an appeal to go through that process to try and do that when they're going to deny it anyway, because they've already made their mind up. Okay, so the, the hypothetical situation we were talking about before, um, and we should actually talk about your situation because we can we can use that to figure out how it would probably work if there was competition in the free market involved. But in the situation we were talking about before, the the guy that wants his property protected um, has paid for insurance, right? He's opted into a, a monthly payment plan um, that involves a defense service. And then the defense service engaged the private legal service, right? So that it got plenty of cover before it did anything uh, as far as using violence to get that yard cleaned up, right? So the, the, the victim or the, actually the criminal in this case isn't paying anything, right? Eventually he's probably paying a lot of restitution because he's causing a lot of, uh, not just property damage, but a lot of cost to somebody trying to get the property damage rectified also, right? So his bill is getting bigger. Um, uh, but, uh, but he hasn't opted in. He hasn't paid for anything, right? Um, he's just a criminal that's damaging people's stuff and is going to be held accountable for that. Um, and the person that is having their stuff protected, they're just paying a monthly fee uh, for private security. Does that make sense? Uh, I think so. It's still okay. So let's let's talk about your situation and let's see how we think that that would play out in a system where there's uh, competing legal services and defense services. So, um, so what what crime did you commit? First of all, whose property did you allegedly damage? And that no. probably I was just going to say that probably answers the whole thing because in our current legal system, ninety plus percent of circumstances in which people are threatened with violence, don't even take the time to presume that there was any property damage done, right? But like the concept is not even in play. You just simply forgot to kiss somebody's ring or provide the right amount of deference, mitt in some way that has nothing to do with anybody else's rights or your rights, um, other than the fact that you are a citizen slave that's expected to behave in a certain way. That is not something that obviously is gonna exist. Um, when it's unprofitable to have citizen slaves. Um, so your situation, I mean, I don't even know what it was, but if there's no property damage, there's no court case. Yeah, it was, it was an inspection ticket, right? So, I mean, it could potentially lead to property damage if I was a delinquent and didn't take care of my car, but that wasn't the case. It was just simply the inspection had lapsed. I was actually on my way to get the car repaired to the point where it could go to inspection. Um, and I had just visited the inspection mechanic. So, you know, did that day, 
and then went to okay. go get the, the car fixed. That so, so, so let's play this out and let's let's try to imagine a, a world where there's private property. There's no there's no concept of uh, like government owned roads, right? So the way that this might have happened is you signed a contract with um, with the company. You're leasing access to their roads. You're paying thirty bucks a month, um, or you've got you, you you pay seventy five cents every time you get on their highway, right? And uh, and when you picked up when you when you uh, when you engaged with these guys and you said I'll pay you seventy five cents I'll you know use this track or whether you opted into this contract you agreed that your car would meet certain safety standards in order to um, uh, basically in order to protect their private property their highways as well as their other customers right and um, and they discovered that you were driving on their road in a car that wasn't compliant and so you actually were violating your contract does that make sense or is that too far out there no no, no that, that makes perfect sense but it's okay, a chicken so in the egg issue but let's talk about how that would happen right like how would that get resolved well the answer is the company that you're doing business with right would say look you broke the contract um you're our customer. We, we probably still want you to drive on our roads, but before we're going to allow you back on our roads, you're going to have to give us $300 um, because, uh, um, because you violated the contract. And you know what? We're a company and we're not stupid, so we probably had that written into the contract, right? If you violate you know, term A, um, if you go over on your cell phone minutes, you pay X number of cents per minute. If you drive on our road with a car that's not properly maintained, you're going to pay three hundred dollars, right? And so there wouldn't even be room really for a dispute in that situation. It would just be give the guy three hundred bucks because you obviously screwed him over and violated a contract. Yeah, but here's here's the problem. In my case, I'm gonna catch twenty two chicken before the egg. My car is lapsed inspection. My car was listed for sale with no reserve and there with an expectation that it would sell. And then I, I'm stuck with having to drive this car to the inspection place to get it inspected, which is uh, the along the route which I get pulled over. So I'm doing my diligence, and I'm yeah, no, over. I, I, I get it. Um, I mean, I think, I think what uh, so again, we're we're dealing with we're dealing with bad incentives here, right? The incentive is definitely to make you pay a fine because there's no consequences for that. And we're not talking about a private company now. A private company, if uh, if there's a lot of stiff competition and they want you to drive on their roads and not somebody else's roads, they, they, they will kiss your ass to avoid a bad Yelp review normally, right? Um, and so they're yeah. probably, they're probably going to say, you know, man, under those circumstances, uh, we're going to let this slide. Or I tell you what, let's make it 50 bucks and don't freaking do it again because you're putting my customers at risk. Next time, call a, call a um, tow truck or whatever, right? They're, but... But the difference is everybody in your situation is incentivized to, to, to squeeze as much money out of you as possible. And that's exactly what anarcho-capitalists are advocating against, right? We're advocating for a system of free market, free enterprise, free exchange, because we know that competition results in good things, right? We know that, uh, that our food is better now, not because the government has decided that you're going to have better food, but because companies are competing aggressively with each other to provide you the right kind of organic kale that was massaged twice a week, right? Yeah. But see, like, you know... Yeah, I'm not sure what I and missed grabbing guess, coffee. Like, did, no, did you guys right, cover no. the potential for like clauses of, let's say, like there is a condition you have to meet to ride on a road, but you are physically incapable of meeting that condition without riding on the road or just like fringe situations like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what we're talking about right there. And then like furthermore, in this instance, I was able to work out a contract, a verbal contract with the officer at the time, which was that um this i obviously have the the two rear tires which needed to be replaced in the back seat and i have the the note from the mechanic i have all of the stuff in order and he says okay i've already phoned this in so you're gonna have to show up at court but i will make sure i show up there and we will take care of this ticket just make sure you get the inspection sticker on there verbal contract i think i'm fine i think i'm gonna have a great day at court that i'm just gonna have to go wait there for an hour 
and uh, get my money back, right? Get my money back. And then uh, I have to, I ended up paying out an additional $80, paying over $130 for something I was told be a verbal contract that I didn't have to worry about. And I broke no law is the way I look at it because I was in a catch 22 situation where it's impossible to invent a law if you can't, you know, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, no, I know what you're trying to say. I mean, I think, I think you, um, yeah, I think, I think the problem is, is incentives, right? Like if you, let me ask you this. Why didn't you have a recording of the conversation with the cop? I really wish uh, I had recorded the entire contents of the courthouse uh, hearing and what the deputy said to me, which is very rude when he threatened me with an arrest that I had already called about. That was a, basically an, an errant threat, right? So, so what do you, uh, I what wish do you I had recorded that, but they explicitly do not allow that. I pulled out my phone to yes. start recording and he, <laughs> you know, he would not allow that. Exactly. That, that, I mean, that, it, go, it goes back to incentives, right? We're not talking about a company that's competing to provide you services. We're talking about a police force that um, that you don't get to opt out of. So nobody really cares whether you're satisfied with your protection and service. Um, and that's why you'll have stuff like, no, uh, you're not allowed to record us because if we beat you or say something wrong or treat, mistreat you in some way, we certainly don't want evidence of that, right? That, that's that's an absurd thing right? that that's proof that this is not a uh, this is not a service that anybody would opt into um, yep. all right um, let's see so yeah uh, I think I think overall you guys probably have at least a slightly better picture of how how a free market could provide uh, security services in the same way that a free market provides food, clothing, shelter, all the other things that you need to survive. Um, and it wouldn't be perfect, right? I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not covered in um, silk from head to toe right now, but it works and it works better than, um, than if uh, people that had violence uh, well, or the, an exclusive right of violence over me. Um, well, it works well, better JW, than that. Uh, just thinking down the route of what I just went through today, it actually feels already very similar to what you just described. Well, I mean, it might, it might feel very similar, right? You, the thing is, is that you might not be happy with the outcome of, um, of any, any given circumstance, right? Like I, I could imagine a situation where you would still have to write somebody a check, um, where you may have actually still violated a contract um, that you agreed to. And that your sob story of, well, you know, there was no way for me to do it would be seen as illegitimate, right? Because if I'm, let's just say I'm another driver on the highway, right? I've got, uh, you know, I've got my twin girls in the back seat. Uh, I don't have twin girls, but just to make it even sadder of a story, I've got my twin girls in the back seat, and you're driving on the same highway with a car that's not up to snuff uh, from a security standpoint or a safety standpoint, let's say. I don't really give a shit if you can't afford to uh, to get a tow truck. And I opted in and did a contract with, you know, Road Service A. And Road Service A, you know, said they are going to make sure that everybody else on the road meets a certain safety standard. I expect them to, you know, put a reasonable amount of effort into making sure that that safety standard is met. And you, your broke ass on the highway doesn't change any of that, right? So I'm not I'm not painting a picture where all of our problems go away and we don't have any conflicts and uh, everything is completely hunky dory. But the 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 difference is, is that a free market is everybody in a free market is incentivized to solve those problems with the least amount of pain and suffering possible, right? Like make the problem go away efficiently. If you go into the Apple store and you're complaining about something, unless you're asking for something that they can't make work, they want to give it to you, right? They're, they're incentivized to have a happy customer walk out the door. Um, that's, that's as best as we've come up with so far, right? There may be better systems that, that can be conceived in the future than the free market, right? I don't think so because I think you know, humans have been around and writing for quite a while now. Um, and we've tried, I think, every single possible other option than, than a free market. And we've tried a free market and we know the, logically the consequences and, and experientially the consequences. Uh, but, you know, theoretically, maybe there is a better solution out there somewhere that we haven't come up with. Um, I'm not saying that there's not. What I'm saying is, is that 
not not um, not operating on the basis of theft and violence against innocent people is possible and it's more effective than what we have now. So we should embrace that um, and we should use that until we come up with something better at the very least. Yeah, I can't really argue with that. I mean, after talking this through, I think this kind of brings most of my criticisms back down to implementation details for the most part. I mean, aside from the semantics of ideology, but that really doesn't cool. have any bearing on like how effective I think a lot of this stuff I mean, be. I mean, so there, there's a few uh, governments in the U.S. that actually run in, in this manner. They, they are effectively privatized, right? No, I mean, no, they no, still no. got... No. no, I mean there, there, there are, there's more private security officers in the United States there's than, experiment. than there are public by some like five times. But there's no, there is no inch of the surface of the earth where a man can stand without an obligation to hand over a percentage of his production to a slave owner on a regular basis. Yeah, they're starting to kind of hybridize things i mean chicago is tell, tell me privatization if you can spree. tell me where that inch of land is chicago oh no i'm not saying to, i'm not saying no, to that chicago, statement I'm just, no. they're just they're playing with privatizing different things like there's actually specific districts in chicago that have a uh, private security force patrolling as well as the uh actual chicago police Right, but this uh, is not this is not what we're talking about. We're not talking. To, this is not a free market um, solution. Like, if the slave owner decides to hire some people to uh, keep the slaves in the pen instead of do it himself, that doesn't make it a free market solution. It doesn't. We've abolished slavery. Well, uh, kind of the, and, the, and in fact, we can end up in a situation where we have the worst of all possible worlds under those circumstances. Well, there there was kind of a time where the council, the city hall, acted as your exchange for people in and out of the police department and all those different areas so it, it wasn't quite a free market but it was definitely like a, a free people market kind of it, you know it, but there wasn't well i, mean, there, I feel there, like there depending been, on your area yeah. there wasn't enough involvement you know so it just failed there, there has been more there has been lesser or greater degrees of oppression over history and, and even under the state right like switzerland for a time was a, a fairly and arguably even now is a is a relatively more free place to live in some ways than the united states and maybe i don't know north dakota is, has um well i mean i guess i guess you could you could certainly argue that colorado at least in regard to um marijuana is a more free place and has less oppression than other places but but what we're what we're really talking about under anarcho-capitalism is the elimination of violence against innocent people right theft and violence against innocent people um is no longer part of the system in anarcho-capitalism so um it's, it sounds radical but you know the other thing that i would say about this is that as far as i can tell it's also inevitable because um because bitcoin makes it uh cost ineffective right it's too it's too expensive to steal from people through taxation in a world of cash in a world of digital cash, it's even more absurdly expensive to try to steal from people. So I think we're entering into a period like we did after the Industrial Revolution with um, with chattel slavery, where it's just it's going to stop existing, um, whether we have another idea or not. I mean, I think fortunately we we know how all of these systems can work without the use of violence against innocent people right we know that the free market can provide food and we have every reason to believe from historical evidence and just sort of theoretical thinking as well that the free market can provide security services and we're very fortunate of that because if all we had was um the the use of uh violence and uh, taxation and theft against innocents to hold all this together the you know the jig would be up here pretty quick because that's not going to work very much longer. oh yeah it'd be yeah yeah, and, and I have a lot of faith uh, over the past decade that, you know, things would go well once we meet this point. Cool. Hey, so we should we should uh, we should wrap it up. That was a fun conversation. Um, uh, wow. We'll uh, we'll record it. And if it sounds good, we'll we'll finish recording here. And if it sounds good, we'll post it. And uh, yeah, hit me up on Twitter um, at Weatherman. I am. And uh, let's see. Uh, what's your uh, what's your Twitter handle? I am at RM0RF. 
Awesome. And uh, your I trolls, right? Something like that. Brian, Brian underscore troll. troll. Come, Come, I will show you the way. Brian, <laughs> under, Brian trolls. Is that it? Or Brian underscore troll? By or Brian underscore uh, trolls with a Z. Ah, perfect. And uh, I'm weatherman. I am on Twitter. So if anybody's listening and wants to uh, wants to chat more about it, hit us up. Mm.